since prophets in general receive their prophecy through symbols, as it says also in, in the Torah and Bamidbar, I think it's Balotcha, when Miriam and Aaron talk about Moses and God appears to them suddenly, and then he sort of says, how dare you talk about my servant Moses, and so, and then it says, when God prophesies his prophets, um, but about Moses, when I speak to Moses, I speak clearly and not with riddles and enigmas, which means that most prophets see their prophecy through metaphors and symbols and riddles. Now, my argument is that even when a prophet writes a book which is not direct prophecy, like the book of Ruth, which is in the third part of the Tanakh called the Kituvim, which means it's not written in direct prophecy, but in Ruach HaKodesh, which means the divine spirit. Even so, the style of the prophet will always be the same style. Once you get used to writing in a certain, certain style, it's hard to change. So even if the book is not direct prophecy, the style of the prophet will not change. And some of the style of the book of Ruth will be like the style of Samuel and the style of Shoftim, which are also ascribed to the prophet Samuel. <clears throat> so I wanted to point that out. Now, without further ado, let's look to see what it says. I have an article I wrote years ago on the book of Ruth. It's called um, Symbolism in the Book of Ruth, and somebody put it online so you can see uh, a resume of it. And it came to pass in the days when the judges judged. One of the difficulties in a lot of these scrolls is to figure out when they were written. And Ruth is, seems to be a big problem. On the one hand, the book of Ruth, um, the matara, the main reason, the purpose seems to be to show the lineage of King David, because that's how the book ends. On the other hand, the lineage seems a little bit funny because it comes from Ruth, who even before Ruth, if you remember, she comes, uh, she's actually a Moabite. And the Moabites came from Lot when he slept with his daughters. <laughs> so, okay, not on purpose, he was intoxicated. But I'm just saying it doesn't always show the best of lineage, but on Boaz's side, it's good lineage. And uh, Ruth, if you remember, and also Ruth is a special uh, person. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's interesting that when you look in Abraham's family, so it appears from the end of the book, uh, the end of the chapter of, um, uh, end of the Parsha of Noah, right before Lech Lecha, right before God appears to Abraham and tells him to go to Canaan. So at the end of um, the Parsha of Noah, we're introduced to Abraham's family. There is Terach, and Terach has three sons, Nahor, Avram, and Haran. And we're told that Terach has a child whose name is Betuel. Nahor has a son whose name is Betuel. And, of course, and then uh, we have Haran. And then we find out also, it says there, that Nahor, the pagan, marries Haran's daughter, whose name is uh, Milka, Avraham marries Sarah, who according to the Midrash was Haran's second daughter, Yiska, and then there's Lot. And Haran dies while Terach was still alive. So out of the three children of Terach, the ones that are left over are Nahor and Avram. And there seems to be a fight going on who is going to claim the family of Haran? Nahor snatches Milka, the daughter of Haran. Avram snatches Yiska, who according to the Midrash is Sarah. And then Avram grabs Hara a lot and says, you're coming with me after Terach dies. And it says, Lot. So Avram takes Lot with him, no questions asked. He takes Lot and he goes, of course, with Sarah. And he tries to influence Lot, but he is unsuccessful. And finally, Avram says to Lot in Parsha Lech Lecha, you're going to have to go your own way. 
You go left, I go right. If you go right, I go left. And then Lot went to Sodom. So Avram was unsuccessful with Lot. But the battle over the family of Terah continues. And then Nahor has a son whose name is Bituel. Bituel has two children. And their name is Lavan and Rivka. And Avram did not give up the battle to win over the family of Terach. And he sends out his son and Sarah. He sends out his son Yitzchak. But he doesn't send his son, he sends a servant. He says, find me a woman for Yitzchak. And the servant goes to the family of Bituel and he finds Rivka. He says, this is the one, and he prays, if you remember. So Rivka marries Yitzchak. So by bringing Rivka to Yitzchak, it's bringing one element back from the lost Nahor family, back into the believers of the one God. The Midrash sort of like um, explains this symbolically. The Midrash says that when Nimrod, who was a pagan, challenged Avraham and said to Avraham, who do you believe in? Do you believe in your God or do you believe in the God of many gods? So first he spoke to Nachor. Nachor said, I believe in many gods. Then he turned to Avram. said, Avram said, I only believe in one God. And then he turned to Haran, the Midrash says. And Haran says, wait, I want to see what happens to Avram before you ask me this question. <laughs> okay. So Avram was thrown into a furnace of fire, according to the Midrash, by this guy Nimrod. And after he was thrown into a furnace of fire, he was miraculously saved and he walk, walked out of the furnace unscathed. When Haran saw this, he said to Nimrod, I also believe in the one God. <laughs> so Nimrod took Haran, threw him into the fiery furnace and Haran died. And that's why it says, Vayamot, Haran of Pnei Terach Aviv, that Haran died during the lifetime of his father Terach. According to the Midrash, what happened? He was thrown into that first furnace by Nimrod when he said he's with Avraham. There's a difference between, between being Avraham and wanting to copy Avraham. It's not the same thing. So Haran is the, you know, so in Avraham's original family, you have three types of mentalities. You have Nachor, who is the idol worshiper, Avram, who's a believer in the one God, and Haran, who is undecided. He needs a little proof. Haran dies, and he leaves his two daughters and son. Each daughter marries somebody else. As I said, Milka marries Nachor, the pagan. Iska, Sarah, marries Avram, the believer in one God, and Haran, who himself doesn't know what to do, and eventually goes to stone. He's also undecided. So Avram doesn't give up. He's fighting for the family of Haran, and now he focuses on Nahor's children. So Bituel is Bituel, but Bituel has a daughter whose name is Rivka. So Rivka marries his son Isaac, and she's brought back into the fold of the believers. But there's still Lavan, and Lavan has two daughters. One of them is Leah, and one of them is Rachel. And then finally, Rivka, says to Yitzchak, I want Yaakov to go to my father's house and I want him to marry somebody from my father's house. And Yaakov goes to Lavan's house and he's there for 22 years and he marries Rivka and Leah. Excuse me, Rachel and Leah, excuse me. Leah and Rachel, both of them. And at that point, the Abrahamic family has now adopted all of the descendants of Nahor, meaning Rivka and, and Lavan uh, excuse me, uh, Rivka and Lavan's children, who are Rachel and Leah. Who's left over? Lot. He's the only part of Abraham's family who Abraham hasn't conquered. Abraham failed with Lot, Lot the son of Haran. But Lot has two daughters, and those daughters bear a child, one of them Moab and the other one Ammon. And these represent cultures which are just like Haran. They can't figure out which direction they're going in. They don't have chesed. They don't have kindness. 
And when Lot goes to Stom, he goes into a city which is devoid of kindness. And when Ammon and Moab are children of his daughters, they are countries which have no kindness and no hospitality. So when the Israelites want to pass through there on the way from Egypt to the land of Israel, they say, you cannot go through our land. You can't buy water or bread or else we will go to war with you. And the Torah says even the 10th generation Moabite shouldn't enter the Jewish people because they, had, they didn't give you even bread and water when you left Egypt. But there is one descendant of the Moabites who is able to redeem that line, and her name is Ruth. And Ruth, what is the most interesting attribute that she has is her kindness. And the whole book of Ruth is about doing kindness. And Ruth is what become, does kindness to the, her dead husbands and to her mother-in-law, who she walks with back to Beit Lechem. And the kindness of Ruth redeems the line of Lot, which Abraham failed to redeem in his lifetime. And that's the book of Ruth. This sort of like spark left over from the family of Haran which is looking for its way back into the Jewish people and the family of Abraham. Okay, we'll just read a little bit because um, we don't have that much time. Rabbi Rafi, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure, sure. Why is it so important to bring all these, the descendants of Haran in, into the fold? I mean... For Avram, it's important. I think it was important to him also because if you believe in something, you know, it's one thing to be an idealist and try to make the whole world believe in it, but you have to start with your own family. If you can't convince your own family, who else are you going to convince? Okay, sometimes it's harder to convince your own family. I agree. But I'm just saying, it looks like, this is an idea I heard from Fenway, it looks like Avram is trying very hard to bring his family into the, into the fold. And what happens years later, this sort of redeems the Haran side, but not fully. Amon and Moab are still Amon and Moab. But Ruth is a good spark that came out of it. That's all. So, and it came to pass in the day when the judges judged. <clears throat> when was that? Now, there is a book called Book of Judges, which is a book written by Samuel, the same author of the book of Ruth, according to the Talmud. But it doesn't say exactly when. Of course, David is the first king of Judea, of Judah, from Judah. Before him is Samuel. Before that, excuse me, before him is Saul. And Saul and David are appointed by Samuel through God. So the book of Judges is right before that. So obviously, if we're talking about a few generations before David, we are talking sometime in the time of the book of Judges. The Talmud says, what does it mean in the days when the judges judged? Or in Hebrew, Shfot shoftim, which almost sounds like the judges were judged. <coughs> so the Talmud says, because the judges were slightly corrupt, let's put it that way. And so if somebody came to a judgment, the judge could say, take that speck out of your eye. And then the person could say, okay, then you take that, uh, splint out from before and from your forehead. In other words, you have things which are worse than me. That's called when the judges were judged. <clears throat> and there was a famine in the line, a certain man from Beit Lechem, who we at the moment don't know his name, in Judea, went to sojourn in the fields of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now in this chapter, one of the things which will be interesting about chapter number one, is this, there is a game going on, a game of names of places and names of people which are symbolic. And if you pay attention to the symbolism chapter one, it helps you understand the purpose of the book. For instance, let's start from the beginning. There is a man and he's from Bethlehem, Bethlehem in Judah. Now, Bethlehem, we all know, is slightly south of Jerusalem. 
Today it's actually quite close because Jerusalem is larger than it was in antiquity. Now, <clears throat> the family's from Beit Lechem, and of course later David is born in Beit Lechem. What does Beit Lechem mean in Hebrew? What does Beit Lechem mean? House of bread. The house of bread. Now look what's going on here. There is um, a play on words. They're leaving the house of bread in a famine, in a time of a famine. Doesn't sound like a smart thing to do. <laughs> okay. You see the play on words. They were from Bethlehem for Beit Lechem, but it means the house of bread and they're leaving in a famine. Not a good idea. <laughs> right? The house of bread during a famine. The Talmud says that Eli Melech was just stingy. He actually was well-to-do, had plenty, but he didn't like all these poor people knocking on his door all the time to ask for money or for food. So he decided just to leave. But the narrative is saying, big mistake, guy. You're leaving the house of bread and the family. It's not going to end up well. And he went to sojourn in the fields of Moab. Now, Moab is a nation right next to us in the area of Jordan today. But uh, what does it mean, the fields of Moab? There were no cities in Moab? There were no fields in Judah? <laughs> of course there were. Why are you calling it Beit Lechem, a city in Judah, and going to the fields of Moab? And also when you, the term Beit Lechem, the house of bread, when you think of a house, you think of comforts of a house, of being protected, of having walls and a door and a key, right? It's a protected area. When you think of field, you think an unprotected area. Could be dangerous. Could be burglars and thieves and terrorists, who knows who. What happens in a field? In general, in the Torah, the field is not the greatest thing. Cain kills Abel in a field. There's a story in Deuteronomy about this dead body that falls in a field and nobody knows who killed it. There's a story about the betrothed woman who was not married uh, who was raped in a field, and therefore it's not her fault because she probably screamed and nobody heard her. So you have the house, which shows comfort and security. You have the field, which is something open and insecure. So when he says the house of bread in Judea versus the field of Moab, it's not that there weren't cities in Moab. It's that Samuel, writing the narrative, wants to remind us that Moab is going to be disaster. It's going to be the field. In general, by the way, field in the Bible, when, it, if, when the field is empty, it means that something bad is going to happen. It's like if you watch an Agatha Christie movie and the murder is about to walk in, you'll hear the music like bum, 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 or something like that. And then you get nervous because something's going to happen, right? The music has to prepare you for what that murder is going to do. So there's no music in the Bible, but there are words. And when the Bible says they went into a field, you know that it's like the ba 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 bum in the Agatha Christie. Something not good is going to happen. So empty fields in the Bible are usually scenarios where not good things happen. Fields with grain are okay. Like the fields of Isaac, where he had a hundred times what he planted. One more verse, because we're coming towards the end. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi, and his sons were Machlon and Chilion, Ephratites, meaning from the city of Ephrat, which is another name for Bethlehem. Ephratites of Bethlehem in Judah, and they came into the fields of Moab, and they resided there. So again, the fields of Moab, they didn't live in a field, they lived in a house, probably in a city, but the narrative calls it fields to say that this is not going to end well. Okay. That's why they're using the term field. By the way, in Hebrew, sadeh, look at the word sadeh, it's like the Hebrew word shed, which is a spirit, a ghost, right? So anyhow, shade, shadow in English, lurking in the shadows. Yeah. Now, what's the name of this guy? His name is Eli Melech. What's Eli Melech? What does that mean? What's Eli Melech? My God is a king. I'm sorry? My God is a king. 
Well, if it was with the tzere, when you say Eli, meaning my God, then it's supposed to have two dots with the tzere. But Eli, Melech, is three dots. So it's like the word El, towards. So Eli, Melech could be, the kingship should come to me. I'm from Judah, Eli, Melech, right? It could also be God as my king if it was a tzere, but it sounds more like, to me, the kingdom. Meaning, I'm from an important family. I, you know, we deserve it. We're in Judah. Remember, all the kings from come from Judah, and we're before will come from Judah at this point, not yet. And we're before David, so it's not only from the Davidic line yet. That was later. Natana Navi promised David the kings would only be from his line. But at this point, anywhere in Judah, you could find the scepter. So um, <clears throat> Eli Melech, his wife is Naomi, which means Naim. She's very pleasant because she will be a pleasant woman. <laughs> so her name describes who she is. And then you have the two children, Machlon and Chilion, Ephratites. And now Machlon and Chilion is very strange. Now some parents have a very funny sense of humor, but to call your children Machlon and Chilion, well, you really have to have, you know, that's almost cruel. Machlon from the word Machala, disease, Chilion from the word klaya, decimation. I mean, what parent is going to call their children disease and decimation? Can you imagine what fun they make out of these kids when they go to school? <laughs> what the other kids in the class are calling them? Disease and decimation. Now, it could be machlon from mechila, forgiveness. That is possible. Chilion is a little harder to explain. But, uh, but it looks like the word machala. Here again, Samuel is playing with the names. Machlon and Chilion made the wrong choice. They went their fathers, they married these women in Moab, and they died, basically. So, which means they brought disease and decimation on the family. The Talmud and the Midrash actually say that wasn't even their real name. I'll read to you their real name. <clears throat> In the book of Chronicles, Divrei Hayamim, Chronicles 1, chapter 4, you have the family tree of Judah. I remember the, they're from the tribe of Judah. In the family tree of Judah, you have the children of the third son. Okay. B'nei Yehuda, Peretz B'chesron, etc. <clears throat> and then you have, I don't know, I always have difficulty finding this verse. Here it is, B'nei Shelah, verse 21. 21. The sons of Shelah, the son of Yehuda, Er, the father of Lecha, Lada, the father of Maresha, and the families of the linen workers of the house of Ashbeah. And Yochim and the men of Kozeva. Now listen to this part. And two fellows whose name were Yoash and Saraf, who married in Moab and came back to Lechem, meaning Beit Lechem. And the story is an ancient story. Interesting, eh? Two people, their name is Yoash and Saraf, Asher Ba'alul and Moab, who married in Moabites and came back to Beit Lechem, meaning the family came back, in this case, the women, but it's, and it's an old story. So who are these Yoash and Saraf who married Moabite women? So the Midrash says it was Machlon and Chilion, and that was their original names. Their names weren't Machlon and Chilion, disease and decimation. Their names were Saraf, which is a type of an angel, a fiery angel, and Yoash, which means God is my fire. That makes more sense. <laughs> and if they're brothers, that also makes sense. Both of them are using the term fire. So the, if their names were Yoash and Saraf, why would Samuel call them Machlon and Chilion? Because 
he changed the names in order to make a, a statement. And the statement was, they made big mistakes and they brought disease and decimation on the family. So let's just call them Machlan and Chilion, <laughs> just for the heck of it. And that's what the Midrash really says. And that wasn't even their really names. And this will be, um, we have to finish because we're getting to the end. So, and Eli Melech, Naomi's husband died. And she was left with her two sons. The Talmud says, why does it say in Eli Melech, Naomi's husband died? We know that Eli Melech was Naomi's husband. You just said so in uh, verse two. <laughs> so, and, then, and we're only in verse four. Excuse me, we're in verse six. It's not so far away. So why are you saying Eli Melech, Naomi's husband died? Which other Eli Melech could it be? The Talmud says, this is to tell you that when a man dies, he dies first and foremost to his wife. She's the one who feels it the most, even more than the children. So that's called Eli Melech, Naomi's husband died. Naomi feels it the most. And she was left with her two sons. And they took wives of Moab. One was called Orpah, one was called Ruth, and they dwelt there for 10 years. Why were they called Orpah and Ruth? Again, we have the symbolism. Orpah means the back of the neck, Oref, because later on the chapter, she is going to turn around and leave Naomi and go back home after her husband died. But Ruth will not. Ruth will embrace Naomi and go back with her to Beit Lechem, even after she loses her husband. So Orpah, which might not have been her original name, is called Orpah, meaning the back of the neck. Ruth is called Ruth, and the Talmud of Baba Batra says, why is Ruth called Ruth? Simple, because there are 613 commandments, and before a person converts, they are still a ben Noah, a child of Noah. So, and when you're a ben Noah, you have seven commandments. So Ruth in Gematria is 606, because originally she had seven commandments. When she joined the Jewish people, she had an extra 606. Altogether, that's 613. So her name Ruth, Reish Vav is 606. Based on what's gonna eventually happen, she will take upon herself the additional 606 commandments. Questions? Okay, I don't want to make this long. That was not my goal. What I want to do just to start a little bit and to show the heavy symbolism at the beginning of the book of Ruth, which will continue to the end of this chapter easily. And the way the symbols are trying to are about names of places, names of people, and it's going to, it, it builds up the story by using the symbols of the names and of the places. Seder? Okay, so I wish everybody Erev Tov. I will try to continue this next week too. Um, we only got halfway through chapter one. I'm trying to keep it short, no more than about 40 minutes. That's the idea. And I'm recording it too if you missed one. And I'll try to do it again next week at around six o'clock on Tuesday. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Appreciate Terrific. it. Thank you. Thank you Shalom. very much. Shalom. Thank you very much. Thank you.